now that we're all awake, um, let's get this show on the road. So before we do, there's a couple of things that I need to accomplish first. Um, the first introduction of the day I need to make is myself. My name is Amy Lewis. I'm the Vice President of Communications and Development at the Wild Foundation, and it is my honor to be here. When Chip and Sally invited me to host this morning um, on life support systems, I was ecstatic um, because our day is not just a day to come here and sit in a room and learn, as Reverend Durley pointed out. It is a day for us to foster community, a day for us to foster the relationships and the seeds of the solutions that we're going to implement that will get us through this mess. And that is why this day is so important. When I look out across this room and I see all of the bold and innovative leaders who are excited to be here, who are excited to be here and who are willing to take advantage of new opportunities and new energy to solve the biggest problems we have ever faced, I look forward to what we're going to accomplish uh, today. So thank you. For my first introduction of today, I am very honored to um, introduce the woman who is the voice of the oceans. As we reflect on how we're going to recover our life support systems, I think it's very important that we first acknowledge where life comes from and what that means. And the fact is that all life comes from the ocean. The ocean, in one sense, is our mother. And that means that each and every person in this room is um, related to one another in uh, the large expanse of uh, the family of life on this earth. So as we consider that and what that means, it is my honor to, rep uh, to introduce to you Sylvia Earle, Nat Geo Explorer, uh, Time Planetary Hero of the Year, and also um, um, the founder of Mission Blue that's uncovering new opportunities for hope with each new expedition. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Good morning, one and all. Special thanks to Chip and Sally and to the board of our day for for really acknowledging this topic that we are about to embark on to lead the discussions this week, and that's the ocean, the ocean. Now we know what was not possible to know when I was a child, when any of our predecessors existed, and that was who we are in the greater scheme of things. Look up at the sky at night. For the first time, we can see ourselves within the context of the universe. I mean, our predecessors tried Copernicus, Galileo, on through time up to the present time, but the kids of today are armed with a perspective or at least access to knowledge that could not exist before right about now. That gives us an edge. And throughout the conference that is going to take place over the next few days, that edge is going to be cause for hope as the technologies and the spirit, the will to use our powers to figure out how are we going to maintain Earth as this miracle in a universe of unfriendly options. They aren't really options. We have Earth, our home. Mars, maybe we'll visit there and set up housekeeping there. We've already sent our instruments there. But for seven billion people, that's a long shot. Oh, even for 10 people, it's a long shot. Well, I don't know about you, but I kind of like the blue one on the left as the place where we ought to be focusing our real attention. Why is it different? Of course, it's about the water. Those who study the potential of life elsewhere in the universe, what do they look for first? Water. Water, and there's a lot of it out there. But as far as we have been able to determine, only this planet is blessed with life made possible by the existence of water. 
at a certain distance from the sun, the miracle that we exist at all, let alone the miracle that maybe we aren't taking our existence for granted anymore the way we have during all preceding time. You breathe the air. What is air? Somebody thought to ask and analyze it and figure it out and to understand what oxygen is and, and what it does and then to look at the elements of Earth. We arrive now armed with the inheritance of knowledge from thousands of years of people who have been inquisitive, use their mighty powers to ask questions and find answers. Never before have we had a better chance, never again will we have a better chance than right now. We are the luckiest people ever to arrive on Earth. And if we blow it, huh, it's our fault because the knowledge is there. The knowledge is there that there are limits to what we can do as a part of a, all the rest of life on Earth to secure an enduring place for ourselves. We cannot do it in the old ways of just consuming without thought whatever serves our immediate perceived purposes. We're so lucky. We have plankton. We have microbes. We have the little guys who do the heavy lifting. Of course, along with trees and ferns and grass and things, the photosynthetic organisms on the planet make our lives possible, but it started in the ocean, and it started with those tiny little creatures who unwittingly, over long periods of time, developed the miracle of photosynthesis, generating oxygen while capturing carbon out of the atmosphere and providing food. Miraculously, and really for the first time in all of human history, we are able to connect the dots in ways that were mysterious in times past. We should have a little bumper sticker saying, have you thanked green plants today? Or have you thanked plankton? Do you like to breathe? <laughs> <laughs> These are the little guys. It looks like plastic, and it's another topic. But in fact, the tiniest creatures feed and provide oxygen and sustenance for the next level and on up through the food chain. And I love being able to get the midst of a food chain, the carbon cycle in action, the nitrogen cycle in action, the oxygen cycle in action. The thing to do is to be a witness without becoming a direct part of it. <laughs> All the sharks and the tunas, and look at the birds diving down from above. They're feeding on carbon-based units called fish that are generated and made possible by the food chain. Of course we're a part of it. You can't escape it. We're alive, we're humans, we are animals. We do not photosynthesize, but it is really fortunate that there are creatures that do, and they've been at it for a long time, shaping the planet into a place that is unique in the universe. It has taken us a few decades to unravel much of that which has taken hundreds of millions, billions of years to establish and put in place here we are, taking it for granted. At least we always could. But each and every one of us is a witness to unprecedented change. I, as a witness, oh, I wish I could share with you the view that I have had over the decades diving into the ocean, going into depths that you can't go holding your breath, unfortunately. We don't have gills, but we have technology that enables us to live underwater. I've done it 10 times, sleeping with a fish, getting up with a fish, getting to know them as, you know, part of our life support system. I love that term. Learned about life support by being dependent on air, oxygen, while underwater. Astronauts know as they go high in the sky, you have to learn everything you can about your life support system and then do everything you can to take care of it. We are just beginning to understand what we are doing to our life support system. We, in some ways, do live in the best of times, greater prosperity, better health, better 
security, it would seem, for an unprecedented number of people, seven billion. When I arrived on Earth, there were only two billion. I've watched 1980, four billion. I, and you too, have witnessed what appears to be the greatest era of prosperity for humankind there has ever been. But what we have failed to do is to account for the cost. It's a poor business model to build your prosperity, your future, on, on substances that take hundreds of millions of years to make that you burn in an instant and use and consume, and until recently, did not understand the downside, the cost of our prosperity. Where does all that cement, the sand, come from to build our instance New Yorks in Dubai, in China? I mean, we, again, it looks like fantastic times ahead for humankind. And maybe there will be fantastic times ahead, but only if we truly account for the cost of our prosperity. Oil, gas, coal have elevated where we were a couple of hundred years ago to levels that were unimaginable to my parents, even to me as a child, to be able to go to the moon, to go to the deepest part of the sea, to come here <laughs> from all over the world to gather. But it's easy to forget about the cost. And oil spills are not the biggest problem. They're just a problem that are, is fairly conspicuous. And we do see and can begin to account for the cost. There's that other oil spill, the petrochemicals that have been turned into what seem to be such wonderful products to foster our convenience and our prosperity. There will be plastics going forward in the future, but maybe armed with knowledge, we can figure out a better way to deal with the materials that we use. I mean, all creatures use the materials in the natural world. We're no different, except that we are different in terms of the volume of what we transform from nature into what seems like a good idea for us at the time. We market concepts. We believe what we hear in headlines about whether it's the benefits of tobacco or the benefits of plastics. We've been sold so many ideas. Uh, National Geographic had full page ads back in the 20s about the glories of lead and how it was great to have lead in paint, great to have lead in fuel. Now we know, and that's the thing. We have the capacity now, armed with knowledge, to do what every kid naturally does, ask questions. Ask questions, why, where, why not? And, and, and to be unsatisfied until we get to the bottom of those questions. Okay, so <laughs> why are we treating nature with such a cavalier attitude? Well, the answer, I suppose, is we did not know. It's easy to be complacent in ignorance, but never before have we got the message. We have to take care of the natural world as if our lives depend on it, because, well, they do, they do. And what we're doing to those systems is catastrophic. We can see it, we can measure it, we can anticipate the consequences. Could not do that when I was a kid to the scale that we now can. We're able to go high in the sky, to send our probes to Mars, to go even beyond our own solar system and look back at ourselves.